Welcome back. In our previous video, we examined how analysts use the payback period method in investment decision making. However, we saw that this measure has a few important drawbacks, which make its implementation on a standalone basis quite problematic. It ignores the time value of money and fails to consider any risk differences. However, there is a variation of the payback period technique that overcomes these shortcomings. It's called the discounted payback period. When using this approach, we first discount the cash flows, then ask, how long does it take for them to recover the initial investment? This allows us to consider the time value of money and discount future cash flows with the respective required rate of return. When calculating the discounted payback period, the main logic stays the same as with the payback period. Let's illustrate it by going back to the alpha example we saw earlier. To compute the project's discounted payback period, we first discount each of the cash flows at the estimated 9% rate. We obtain $64.22 million for year 1, $58.92 million for year 2, and $54.5 million for year 3. The combined discounted cash flows for the first two years of the project equal $123.14 million. This means that we need $26.86 million of the cash flow in year 3 to break even. It's important to note that $26.86 million divided by $54.5 million is equal to approximately one half of the third year's cash flow. Assuming that the cash flow is paid uniformly throughout the year, we can say that the discounted payback period would be two and a half years. It's not difficult, right? Notice that Alpha's discounted payback period is longer than its payback period. How come? You already know that money today is more valuable than money tomorrow. That's why cash flows received tomorrow are worth less and capital recovery, or return of the initial investment, takes longer. All right, what about the drawbacks of this measure? You can see that the discounted payback period looks a lot like NPV. It uses the time value of money to discount cash flows. Still, it doesn't consider what happens beyond the break-even point. Let's elaborate a little bit more here. In the example with Alpha, the project's duration was three years. Now imagine that the investment had a project life of five years. However, due to deteriorating market conditions, the cash flows in years four and five were negative as seen on the following timeline. If Alpha didn't combine decision-making methods and use the discounted payback period technique only, it would have made a huge mistake because we can see that the NPV, in this case, is minus $67.89 million. The example shows that using the discounted payback period only turns out to be misleading. To sum up, we should use the discounted payback period mainly as a liquidity measure and not as a profitability indicator. If we have already gone to the trouble of discounting the cash flows, we might as well just add up all the discounted cash flows, calculate the NPV, and use it to make a decision. Although discounted payback looks a bit like NPV, it is a poor compromise between the payback method and the net present value. We should never use it in isolation, but instead, supplement it with other measures such as NPV and IRR to avoid making wrong decisions. Great! Next on our to-do list is the Average Accounting Rate of Return, or AAR. See you in a bit. Thanks for watching.